Welcome to the Institute for Career Transitions webinar series. Uh, the ICT is dedicated to supporting job seekers in transitions. Our uh, most recent focus has been on workers who are older and, and for one reason or another, long-term unemployed. Uh, we're trying to find the best information for this particular group. I'm Ofer Sharon. I'm a sociologist and uh, the director of the Institute for Career Transitions. Behind the scenes here is uh, Susan Joyce. You can't see her, but she's the person actually making this happen. Um, she also runs an essential website for all job seekers, jobhunt.org. And this is our first webinar, uh, and we're very excited to have as our first guest, Dick Bowles. Uh, the color of what color is your parachute? Uh, a book that's often called the Bible for uh, job seekers. It sold over 10 million copies. It's been translated to languages, uh, it's sold all over the world. It's in its 44th year. Uh, this is probably the book that doesn't require any introduction. I, I have a couple of copies. Uh, I think it's got very valuable advice for job seekers. And um, just mention one of the awards that it's won is, is Library of Congress picked it out as one of 25 books that have changed lives. Um, and that's what we hope to do here, is to help change lives in a positive direction. So welcome to the webinar, Dick. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Ofer. Uh, do you want to mention that I'm an MIT alumnus? That's right. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I'm coming to you from MIT, where I work, and, and Dick is actually, we're very proud that, that you once attended our institution. And so it's also fitting to have uh, an MIT alum as our first guest. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, jump right in with some questions about job search mechanics and strategies. Um, and, and as I look at, you, at your uh, advice for job seekers, the one overarching word that comes to me is proactive. You have uh, a set of, of strategies that uh, I think are telling job seekers you need to be more proactive um, than you might think. And so let me ask you about some of these uh, strategies. For example, you say that Go for organizations that interest you, regardless of whether they have a job opening posted or not. Uh, now, the typical conventional approach would say, I'm going to wait for a job opening. Why would I approach an organization that's not telling me they have an op any opening? So can you explain a little bit the logic and how you think this is effective? Sure. I'll, I'll explain the logic directly, and then I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, the logic directly is that we've just found that when people approach organizations irrespective of whether they've yet published a vacancy, they often have a vacancy, but they haven't gotten around to announcing it. And you find that there's a, a gap between the time that a particular hiring agent or employer decides they want to create a new position or fill in a, one that's just suddenly become vacant. We found out there were sometimes people who approached an organization at 11 o'clock and it turned out the vacancy had developed at 9.30 that morning. In other words, there's a gap between the time an employer knows they have a vacancy and the time that they uh, say it. So if you approach an organization that interests you, you first of all bring a bit of energy that the uh, employers really looking for that you're enthusiastic about working at that place and not simply selecting it because it, its vacancies appeared on some job board and secondly the um, employer also understands that you are maybe approaching them at maybe I mean to get a little uh, in the faith realm maybe God sent you at that point to fill the vacancy so so from Experience, we've learned, I mean, I've, I've been studying job hunters uh, 45 years, as you mentioned, and we discovered that when people pay no attention to whether or not there is an advertised vacancy yet, there may be a vacancy at that place, so it makes no sense to wait for them to publish it. Let me just say that uh, to support what you're saying, there's a recent study came out this week from the AARP um, that looked at what uh, made a difference between job seekers who got a job quickly and those who got um, became long-term unemployed. And actually, 
they said the number one difference was direct contact. So the method that most, most led to not being long-term employee was this direct contact of employers. Very consistent with what you're saying. Now, I know from talking to uh, hundreds of job seekers, the thing they would say or a question they would have is, okay, I see that it's effective, but I just uh, can't do it. It's re I feel like a nuisance. I feel like I'm stalking. I feel like um, I come across as desperate. People feel intensely uncomfortable approaching an employer when that employer hasn't created some kind of, you know, posted an opening saying, come to me. So how, what's your suggestion for how people might deal with that awkwardness and feeling that they are coming across as desperate or as a nuisance? Well, we found out over the years that the, um, let me get my thought together. Um, we found out over the years that the most effective job hunting always began with one step. It was, uh, intuitive it was never uh, they didn't have to read a book to do it they started with trying to find out more information and job hunters who don't understand job hunting because it really is a learned skill job hunters who don't understand job hunting think that uh, they have to as you said wait un uh, until there's a vacancy but if they start out by doing an inventory of themselves, they gain the confidence that uh, you just spoke of uh, lacking in people that have been at it too long and, and hung out to dry. So we always say to people, we've found over the 40 plus years, uh, again talking to job hunters, working with job hunters, we found that what is most successful is when they begin with a self inventory because it re they have to unlearn certain things about their picture of themselves. They have a picture that's conditioned a lot by the job titles they've held over the years and so on. If they start with a self-inventory, then you get a very different kind of uh, confidence and they don't have that kind of uh, hesitation that you were speaking of. Can you go a little deeper into that? How, how do you understand um, having better understanding of yourself relating to a um, better approach or more confident approach to the employer? Well, uh, we help people to, uh, and I have in my book for years, we help people to sit down and figure out what parts of themselves correspond to a job. And then there's several parts to a job. One is uh, transferable skills. So. A self-inventory involves sitting down and figuring out, first of all, what uh, transferable skills you have, like analyzing or researching or teaching or whatever, and then deciding among those that you have, which ones do you most treasure and most enjoy using. So a self-inventory is always looking for the parts of yourself that correspond to the parts of a job and deciding among the uh, armory that you have, as it were, to go out into the battlefield of the job hunt that you have chosen the things you care the most about. So this gives you a, a, a kind of a sense of excitement and, and a sense yeah, of energy confidence. above everything else. If you stop to think and talk to employers, and I've talked to, <laughs> I don't even count how many now, uh, employers will always tell you when it comes down, push comes to shove, that what they're really looking for is energy. They want mm -hmm. energy, of course, first of all, focused on the duties and tasks of the job, but they also like energy in terms of people keeping at a task and not just giving it a lick and a promise and then saying, well, I did it, I, or I tried it, and it didn't work. So uh, energy is a key concept. Enthusiasm is another way of stating it uh, in searching for work. So, so um, I, I want to come back to the self-inventory question uh, in issues later a little bit, but I want to stay with um, some questions about proactive approaches and, and circle back. So, um, one other advice you have that I want to probe a little bit on this in this vein is uh, for particularly older workers or workers who may have a harder time getting in through um, in the labor market into a job is to approach smaller or medium-sized organizations as opposed to large ones. And I wonder if you can say, based on your experience, why 
you give that advice about smaller, medium organizations? Well, because I found more of them could find jobs approaching smaller organizations than larger. Uh, I, I am an empiricist. I mean, I, I was course 10 at MIT, and then I studied physics at Harvard. So I always start out with that hard-headed attitude, does it work? And what does work and what doesn't work? Job hunting, if you stop to think about it, is a series of techniques designed to get rid of problems. And I can give you a, a simple example. Nathan Azrin was a, a behavioral psychologist in Illinois back in the 1980s, and he was tasked with a particular assignment. They discharged people from the Illinois uh, mental hospitals, and they couldn't find a job. And they started to define a successful discharge as people being able to find their way back into society. So he was given the task of, of helping them find work. And he had an 86% success rate, even with that population, which we may assume faces more hurdles than uh, somebody who hasn't been in a mental hospital. Now, what he discovered was that uh, if you see a problem, figure out how to solve that problem. You keep speaking about proactive. I keep speaking about sol uh, techniques as having evolved because they solved the problem. And I'll give you an example from his work. He first of all decided, and these were in the days when the telephone was didn't have a menu of 20 options and were used as a wall between you and the employer. So he had them uh, uh, find out which uh, smaller employers they wanted to approach, and he had them memorize what they were going to say. Then fine. They, they were very good. They could memorize the whole spiel. It took about a minute and a half. And when they got on the line with the employer, they completely froze. They absolutely couldn't remember what it was they had just been spouting so, and it speaks to the anxiety you were just talking about. Yeah. So what he did was he said, okay, I'll invent, I'll, I'll write the script out, and you keep reading it over and over again to yourself until you can read it, but it sounds normal and as if you're uh, creating it on the spot. And so he put them back on the uh, line, and they started approaching the employers again, and they skipped right over some of the paragraphs that he had written out carefully for them. Again, their nervousness just made them skip sentences, words, and so forth. So he said, okay, that's another problem. I'll fix that. So what he did was he made a copy of that script, that minute and a half or less uh, spiel, and he gave it to a, a fellow job hunter. So let's call these two job hunters A and B. A yeah. got on the phone, but B was given an extension line on that same phone and could listen to A uh, as they were talking to the employer. And any time A left out, any part, crucial part of what they were uh, supposed to say to the employer, uh, the B would check it off on their copy. In other words, they would underline the word they left out or they'd uh, put a bracket around a paragraph that their eyes skipped completely over, and it cured it. It, it was a su great success. As I said, he had an 86% success rate in these discharged uh, patients from mental hospitals in finding work. And everyone noticed his... Uh, brand and they called it the job club. In fact, that was his own designation. So I knew Nathan very well. He died about two years ago. Uh, and I uh, often asked him about the method. And he said, well, it works well until they try to replicate it. Yeah. And what happens when they try to replicate it is they want shortcuts. And so they immediately say, ah, I don't see any need for this extension phone. And so they would cut out the guy listening or the gal listening on the uh, other line, and the reintroduce the skipping over paragraphs or sentences all over again. So every job hunting technique has been evolved by somebody over the years out of their own experience when they go job hunting or trying to change careers and they discover there's a problem and they try to figure out or somebody who is trying to aid them and help them like a counselor figures out, okay, we got to do something to correct this. So it isn't just that people have to be proactive. They have to notice what problem is this technique designed to avoid or solve. And that makes all the difference in the world in understanding why they have to do what they do. And my book has, for years, been a kind of compendium of the mistakes that job hunters make 
and what techniques can be evolved and have been evolved successfully to help them over the hump. It sounds like a lot of trial and error is at the core of this. Oh, uh, as I said, I'm an empiricist. I don't mind trying. I used to teach workshops that lasted two weeks every summer. Came people came from all over the world, about 90 people, each each summer, and uh, they always were talking about that. I forget, I lost part of my thought right there. <laughs> let, let me move on to another uh, something that's that's constantly being. Uh, told to job seekers is to network, network, network. Um, and you say you recommend people use a bridge person, uh, someone they know can, can vouch for them and who knows someone in the organization where they want to work. Yeah. Um, that's great if you have it. What if you don't have a bridge person? Do you think that um, you can create one? You can, and if so, yeah. how? How do there, you go about creating well, a bridge? The chief instrument used to be a website called Jobs with Friends. It was ingenious. Uh, what it did is uh, asked you for permission to look up all the links that you had if you were on the site LinkedIn and all the friends you had if you were on the site of Facebook. And then it listed where they worked. It picked up that information from those two sites. It alphabetized it. And so you could look up the name of a company you were interested in and see if you already had a link or a friend there who would serve as that bridge person. Facebook changed their parameters as they are wont to do. <laughs> and uh, so as of J July, no, it wasn't July, it was January 28th, they terminated that agreement. So now Jobs with Friends has vanished. But what you can do is uh, you can use LinkedIn in the same way that that website used to. You can go to that website and research companies and find out if there's somebody among the links that you already have on that site that uh, can serve as the bridge person. Now, let's take the worst case possible. Yes. And that is where they just say, I don't have enough friends. I've led the life of a hermit and so on then you're just going to have to fall back on some people you know in the world of work that may not know that company but at least can maybe tell you somebody they know that knows that company. So it's a, it's a strategy, as you correctly pointed out, that does not work for everyone. Um, it depends a lot on how much of their life is social. If they have a rich social life, and this is one of the things we advise job hunters, especially uh, job hunters. In the, incidentally, I work for AARP, so <laughs> I know full well their program. Uh, so uh, they have to devise some method of uh, figuring out what they're going to do to get in there. I just don't think resumes have a track record that's worth anything, and especially since after 2008, I think... Employers have a disdain for uh, resumes that has gotten more acute, and uh, the consequences is uh, years and years ago, we used to discover that there was one job offered and accepted for every uh, 270 resumes that floated around out there in the world of work. It, it, nobody would go up in an airplane if they found out that only one out of 270 planes ever got through. But people accept that kind of an odd with a resume cheerfully because they don't really know of any alternative. Talking about a bridge person reminds them there are other ways of approaching organizations than through a piece of paper. And as I said, it may not work for everyone, but it's amazing how many people it does work for. So one, uh, just to follow up on this, on the networking and using bridge people, and in the context of the the people that, that ICT is most focused on, um, so you have someone who's been out of work six months or longer. Um, when we say, when they hear network, 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 they often feel like, um, I really hate, you know, approaching people at this point because I feel like, uh, I feel like a loser. I feel like my, my self-esteem is in the bucket, you know, is down the drain. Um, it's very hard for me to put myself out there in that way. I feel very vulnerable. 
Any advice for someone who's in that position to self inventory? You'll hear me say it like a staccato <laughs> riff on the drum. It's self inventory, self inventory, self inventory is the key to getting past that lack of self confidence. We've discovered it again and again. I just had a, a thing on my website where this person said, I'm 34 years old. I was moving from classical music into, uh, I don't know what it was exactly they're moving into, but very different. He said, I just had my first job interview in my whole life. I'm 34 years old and I got the job and uh, Parachute was front and center in helping me do that. So I wanted to thank you. And you find people again and again, if they have done a self inventory first, their self-confidence is so built up they don't have the kinds of problems that you are reciting from your interviews with people. I, I guarantee you, if you went back and talked to these people and asked them, uh, how much self-inventory did you do before you went out on your job hunt, you would not be surprised at the answer. And, and just to connect the dots, the logic is, if you do the self-inventory, you become uh, it's more salient in your mind, what are my skills and what are the skills I'm excited to use? Uh, and this changes both your confidence about your skills and your energy. That, am I summing? Yes, that that's question? a good summary. And I would add that uh, you see yourself more in terms of building blocks, more in terms, I mean, I'm a physics major, so more in terms of the atomic level of job hunting and, and understanding of yourself you see yourself in terms of building blocks. So let's say, let's just talk about one aspect. There's seven aspects to the self-inventory that we found are useful. Seven parts to a job and seven parts of you that correspond to that. And we've discovered that when people uh, go about doing that, oh, I lost my thought again. Um, hold on. <laughs> just repeat the last thing you were the building, saying. Well, the building blocks. Yes, building blocks. So let's, let's picture some building blocks. Let's picture three on the bottom, two on the next level, and one on the top. And let's put transferable skills there. So let's say a particular person has among their transferable skills designing, teaching, researching, um, and writing. So if they put designing in the top building block, that means they can go look for work that involves design. If they put researching in the top building block, that means they can go looking for a job that involves researching. In other words, they get a series of modalities, a series of options of what they can look for rather than just being locked into the kind of thing that, well, I was taken over to Spain a couple of years ago to train some of the people there and they uh, said the big industry that was losing jobs at that time was uh, construction. And I said, well, what are you doing about it? And they said, we're training, training them to be computer repair people. And, and if you didn't get successful at being a computer repair person, you were dead. If you make, break your understanding of yourself down into the basic building blocks of who you are in the skills areas I just illustrated and in other areas as well, then you have many more options, many more paths you can take in your job search where you will still be loving what you're doing but you've given a different priority to the thing that you are choosing to concentrate on at that during that job hunt. Now I know you're not a big fan of uh, inventories like uh, people do assessments as a way to... Um, you about tests, yes. Yeah, these kind of tests. Yes. So, so, so uh, some job seekers, um, you know, are, are think that, you know, are drawn to these, what, what's your take on it and, and why do you think other approaches might be better? Well, um, all these assessments, as you correctly call them, and tests as most people refer to them, uh, all of these tell what family you belong to. In other words, they can't tell you you, they can only tell you uh, what other people who have answered similarly to you in that assessment have come up with as their job titles or the things they're searching for. So I grew up in a family where everyone in the family was extremely left-brained. I don't know why, but they all were. 
my father was a journalist, my brother was a journalist, my grandfather was a journalist, and so on. They lived by the printed word. And uh, I was a maverick in that family. I was uh, right-brained through and through. In fact, uh, I was told by a friend of mine who was uh, skilled in the psychic arts that every time he asked me a question, I thought in terms of a picture before I answered in terms of words. So my dad was so understanding of that. He, he said, he'd ask me how I could do a certain thing, and I'd say, I don't know, Dad, I just can. And he'd die laughing. He'd slap his knee and say, Dick, I will never understand you. So you're often a maverick in a family. And when a test uh, tells you you're blue or you're uh, SIA or whatever the uh, way in which they tell you their results are, when they tell you that, all they're telling you is you belong in this family. But they can't say that that is an accurate description of who you are as an individual in that family. You may be quite different from the other people who answered similarly to you. I do have one the parlor game, I, li I like to call it. It's not an assessment, but it's called the Dewey Color System. And I stumbled across that on the Internet, and I answered it. And I, I like the answers they gave me about who I was because they said, uh, you're basically a researcher and you're basically uh, a creator. And uh, that nails me to the tree <laughs> very accurately. So if you take an assessment and you like what you find, uh, one time a guy came to me and he said, I just took this five-day uh, visit to the Princeton Institute and did they ever nail me correctly? They got me perfectly. And I said, how did you know that? <laughs> and he couldn't answer because he, he was using a knowledge of himself superior to the assessment to evaluate the assessment. Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. That's usually the case. We all have concepts of ourselves that we use to determine how we see ourselves and how we function in the world of work. So let me, uh, let me go back to a question that I think um, if I had uh, the people uh, we support, this would be maybe the first question they would have asked you, is given that I'm out of work now six months or a year, or in some cases more, there's this gap in my resume. And employers, as soon as they see the gap, um, they just toss it out. You know, there's maybe even automated filtering. We're not sure how it all works, but we yeah, see the There are machines that actually toss out. Yeah, so how do I deal with the gap? How do I uh, get over being screened out because, just because I'm unemployed? You won't like my answer. <laughs> Don't use a resume. Well... The jobs that I see that I can apply to, they require me to submit a resume. What do I do? It's because your job hunting technique is determining the success or failure of your job hunt. And in that case, your job hunting technique is waiting until there's a vacancy before you submit uh, an application. Uh, we're back to our earlier discussion, which is why do we wait? Why can't we choose places where we think we can uh, be an asset and help produce what they need for the bottom line in terms of either saving them money or creating revenue for them with whatever product or service they're trying to uh, get out into the public. If you start with the premise, I will not approach a company until there's a vacancy, then of course you have to use a resume. And, and I, I would add uh, over there's a a study that was done, two, two different studies. One found a typical response to an advertised vacancy was 250 people. Another, more recent, found that the average number of applications to an announced vacancy was 118. It also was, it was discovered that the average employer only interviews 5.4 people before they decide to hire. So, they have to get that 250 applications, or that 118, if you believe the other study, down to 5.4, because that's the whole point of a resume, to get the stack down to uh, a measurable amount of people that the employer has to see. So if you wait until there's a vacancy, you're competing against a lot of people, and the employer is looking at your resume, as you well said, uh, to find some excuse to uh, 
put it in the trash file or in the to be looked at later file. Everything, so yeah, yeah, let me add one thought. Yeah. Everything depends on job hunting behavior. We we have locked into ourselves this concept over the years that uh, everybody hunts the same way and therefore if nobody can find work, if somebody's out of work for a long time, there just are no jobs. And as you know, and uh, many of our listeners won't, there are two reports from the government every month and one is called JOLTS, and that's job openings and uh, transition, transition uh, stuff. And uh, they report that typically there's somewhere between 8 and 10 million jobs that open up each month, and only half of them get filled by the end of the month. In other words, it takes longer for the employer to find someone for that empty slot. So if there's 8 to 10 million vacancies opening up every month, Surely, the reasons people can't find jobs is not because there's some immutable framework to the whole job market and the whole job hunt. It's because of differences in job hunting behavior, and that's been the most signal uh, discovery we've made uh, over 40 years in studying the job hunter in uh, connection with my work. We found out job hunting behavior changes radically from one job hunter to another, and if they uh, adopt one kind of job hunting behavior, they will often run into a dead end. The problem is not that the, uh, there's some immutable power they're uh, powerless against that's controlling their destiny. It's they need to think of how can I change my job hunting behavior so that it actually works. And that will not be the same from, say, 2000 to 2008 or from 2008 to 2015. What works in one year particularly well may not work that well in other years. And I point particularly to resumes as an example of that. Since 2008, a resume has had a much lower success rate uh, because employers can afford to hold out for the ideal candidate, even if that ideal candidate is a myth. So let, let me follow up on, on this uh, concept of control and, and, and job seekers' control of their search. But this is um, actually, you know, so you write, um, you're not powerless up against forces that you cannot control. You, you control the one thing, one thing above all else, how you search. And that, my friend, is the key to finding not only work but meaningful work. So let me, let me and it's similar to what you said now. And, and I, I think it's true. On the one hand, job seekers do have control over how they search. And, um, but there are elements that are outside their control and, and like yeah. you know, the number of jobs, the quality of jobs, this is what might change also from year to year. The fact that there's discrimination against someone who's long-term unemployed. So how do you walk this tightrope? On the one hand, you want to emphasize the degree of control. On the one other hand, you want to also recognize there are degrees outside your control so that you don't blame yourself for the fact that you're getting no, 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 no. Uh, for a long time, which is what many job seekers face. Um, how do you how do you walk that tightrope of understanding what's in your control and what's not? Well, you look for what is within your control, and as I say in another section of my book, other than the one you just quoted, I say your your degree of control may be only two percent, but if you work on that, and I cited an example in another realm where a woman had MS and uh, came to see me when she was despairing of ever finding any help. And then uh, I said to her, what is MS? And she said, I don't know. And I said, well, I don't either, so that makes us even. Uh, but how about us assuming that maybe just 2% of whatever's going on in your body is something you can change or affect? Would you like to work on that? And, and she said, yes. So we met weekly for several months, and all her paralysis went away from the MS, and she became a model on 57th Street in New York City. And uh, it made a big difference by her agreeing, okay, maybe there's some part. It's a hypothesis at this point. Maybe there's some part that's within my control. And if I try to seek out that, if I make that my search, not just for a job, but find out what part of my job hunt, hunting strategies are within my control, 
and I try to change that, sometimes it's like the uh, famous butterfly effect where the butterfly's wings in one part of the country affect something going on about 18 states away. Uh, it's amazing sometimes how little things can change, uh, can cause huge uh, alterations in a person's success. It seems that one of the keys, given uh, partial control, you know, 2% or may maybe, you know, there's some control but a lot outside your control. So it seems like a big factor here is going to be resilience, being able to stick with some search process that where you encounter as you also write no, 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 and then we hope at the end there's going to be a yes or maybe a couple of yeses. How do you, you know, when someone says to you, I'm just, can't take it anymore, the no, 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 no is so discouraging, how do you best advise people to keep going, to find the energy, what it takes to keep going? It's brutal. I, I'm going to risk sounding very dumb, but the answer is self-inventory. We found again and again when they really do that self-inventory, they do not have these kinds of problems. That's just empirical. I didn't invent that idea. I've just found out it was true. So. Uh, you can talk to a lot of job owners, particularly ones that have been out of work over a year, and that's a huge percentage. I think it runs about 25% of job owners, or has recently, that are out of work that long and searching and searching. You, you will get a lot of this kind of uh, disparaging of the, the hopelessness of their situation. It's just a part of human nature. We hate rejection, yet the job hunt is by its very nature a series of rejections uh, most often before there's any yes, yes, yes in the interview process. So let's let's hone in on the self-inventory. Um, it's it's you know it's something you go back to not just in this interview, but you you put it as your number one principle. And in, in oh, let me interrupt you right there, and then you can continue your sentence. Yeah. You go back to it because you are citing listening to people complain who have been put through the mill and are just exhausted. You are citing those people, and I'm trying to say that's basically a problem of self-confidence, and the remedy is the self-inventory. That's why I keep emphasizing that. Right. And, and, and I, you know, just, just I, I, the reason I keep bringing it up is because when I interview hundreds of people, this is, I hear the pain of that process, and uh, mm. it's, it's a very real pain. Um, have you ever job hunted? Of course, of course. Yeah. No, I have. I, I, I cried sometimes when I got turned down. Yes, it's very brutal. And, uh, and, and so maintaining resilience is important. And, um, you know, so, so the principle that, uh, about self-inventory, you know, one way you put it is, is don't, assume, uh, don't assume the job is the given. Assume yourself is given. And then find a job that fits fits who you are. Um, can you say a little bit why you, you what's what's underneath that? Um, why you put that as such a top, as a top top principle for job seekers? Sure. Because I am a realist, an empiricist, as I mentioned, and I know they're not going to find their ideal job. That's that's uh, it's rare when they do. Uh, so let's say they're going to find an overlap between the job they do find and the job they've outlined in the self-inventory or whatever. There's an overlap. And let's say there's an overlap only to a, a degree of 50%. The larger the vision they have of what they're ideally suited to do in the world of work and what they want most to do because they made that the key to their self-inventory, not just what can I do, but what do I love to do, they have a very different approach. It makes, uh, I lost my thought again, repeat your question. Yeah, just, well, you're talking about the importance of thinking about what you love to do as, as Oh a yeah, I'm talking about overlap. Because they're only going to find a certain overlap in uh, what it is they find initially, it's important for them to dream big. 
because better to find 50% of a big dream than 50% of a dream you've already cut down in the interest of so-called being realistic. So many job seekers, I think, would say, um, thinking about what job I love or my dream, I can't afford that luxury. I, you know, I'm about to lose my house. I need any job. And you would say, what would be your response? I acknowledge that may be the situation they're in at that moment, but they shouldn't accept that as their permanent future. I mean, I, I, I get letters all the time from readers. I, I have a tremendous volume of mail, and uh, they will tell me this and that and this and that, and I always try to be sympathetic, but I say, look, you may have to take a temp temporary job now. It may not be your ideal job. That's fine, but what are you settling for? Are you settling for that as your permanent future? Or are you taking that while you're still continuing your job hunt? It makes a big difference whether they've given up or whether they still are fighting to find what they feel would give meaning to their lives. I want to ask you about trade-offs in, in these kind of decisions. Uh, so, so when you think about meaning, sometimes, often I think, there are jobs that may pay better, have more security here, and then jobs that feel more meaningful um, over there. I mean, I, I personally went through that, giving up a, what was a very financially lucrative career as a lawyer to become um, an academic, not quite as, as, as rewarding financially, but much, much more meaningful. Um, at many levels, people are making these kind of calculations as they decide their career decision. How would you suggest people think about these trade-offs and think about uh, making these kind of career decisions? I bet at another time in your life you might have made a, a different decision. Everything is very existential. It depends on what our mood is. And nobody can tell anybody else what is the most important quality of a job. I mean, let's tick off very quickly the parts of a job. There's first of all, the transferable skills. Now, some people may say, I don't want to do any job unless I'm able to use my favorite skills. I'm a good analyst, and I want to be, a, I'm a good researcher, and I want to be in a job where I can do those things. And that is the sine qua non for why they would take a particular job. You'll find another person, geography is another part of a job. You'll find uh, some people will say, geography is the most important part of the job. I need to be near my family, or I want to be where there's a lot of ruralness and trees and forests and streams around me, or whatever. And so another part of the job would be your working conditions. Do you like to be in an office? Do you like to be windowless, or do you like to have windows, and all of that? It makes a big difference when you start to say, what is the most important part of a job to me? Now, for some people at certain junctures in their life, they would say the salary or the rewards from the job are the most important part. Another time, they would say the mission or meaning, which is the, one of the other parts of a job, is most important to me. Everyone will deal with this question of what is the priority uh, between, say, meaning and, and reward. They'll deal with that question in a different way at different times in their life. And therefore, I've never tried to tell people how to make that kind of a decision. I've tried to say, look, do a thorough inventory of what are the things you would like to accomplish with your life. That's, uh, we have a flower diagram we tell people to use, and there's a reason for that, which I won't go into right at the moment. So uh, they do a careful definition of their, it was essentially their philosophy of life. If they've done a thorough definition of it, they may find, hey, the most important part of a job for me out of the seven possibles, the most important part of a job for me is, as it turns out, what the meaning and mission of that organization is and what I'm able to do toward my own definition of my mission in life. Uh, so the most careful detailed inventory takes two weekends, period.
we've timed people on doing this and we know how long it takes and when they are thorough in it they can make a decision that will guide them for that particular moment in their life they may say at this moment I need money more than anything else or they may say at this moment I want uh, to be surrounded by really wonderful people more than anything else but the inventory is the doorway to making that kind of a decision so Dick, I'm going to ask you one last question uh, before I thank you, and and just really um, open it up to you to say what if you had one takeaway that you wanted people who are long-term unemployed, maybe feeling discouraged, what would you say to them? You want to guess what I would say? After self-inventory. That's right. I'm <laughs> sorry, but I've, I've you know I've been doing this for 40 years uh, my search has been simple it's been to find out what the problems are in job hunting behavior and what are the ways around those problems and the success rate of people who have followed the uh, things I've discovered as a kind of a scientist or a kind of work empiricist have worked tremendously well in their lives that's one of the reasons why the book is sold so many millions of copies it's one of the phenomenons in the publishing world and it's not because it's well written or it's not because I'm too cute or whatever it's because they try the book and they find out wow this really works I'm astonished because I've spent so many years listening to these same kinds of complaints as you have I've spent so many years listening to them and I know there has to be some way around the problems. If we decide that we're going to create excuses for why our life is not working, then that becomes its own defeat. We defeat ourselves. If we say, I'm going to find out what there is that I can change in my job hunting behavior that will help me to be effective and successful in finding what I'm looking for, and I know what I'm looking for because I did a self-inventory, then we change our whole uh, approach to the job hunt. It makes every bit of difference in the world whether we are determined to conquer our uh, obstacles and, and um, challenges in life or whether we're determined to find excuses. Dick, I, I want to uh, thank you for, for speaking with us today. As, as, as we both know, there, there are millions of people uh, in our country today, we're, we're facing very tough uh, structural obstacles, and uh, and I really hope that that um, the advice you've given is 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 going to pay off, and that um, um, and I want to sincerely thank you for sharing your wisdom. It's nice to see you again, Alfred. <laughs> thank you so much, Doug, and come visit us at MIT. I will. <laughs>